ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are here honored by the presence of some truly illustrious teachers uh, from the educational side of the universe. Um, three of them are from Notre Dame. One of them is uh, from um, Turkey, from the university in Istanbul, and he is a multi-graduate, BA, MA, and PhD from La Sapienza. Um, these individuals are both great teachers, and they have some of the finest students. How, how do you how do you qualify a teacher by the quality of their students' work? Their students' work is is amazing. Um, they are really a light unto nations when it comes to teaching. Uh, the coordinator of the session is Julio Cesar Perez Hernandez, our a colleague from uh, Notre Dame and um, the man who for fi last 15 years has been running the uh, Havana charrettes. I participated in two. I highly recommend uh, that you join these. They are high, medium, and low level all together. Fantastic week-long charrettes in Havana, each one doing another part of the town. Um, Julio, um, please take the floor and um, do your magic with these great people. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Nir. Um, I would like to start by, say, by saying how honored and humbled I feel for moderating this panel uh, where um, my colleagues, um, Richard Economakis and Samir Junes are, and also Professor Alexandro Camis. Uh, I'm extremely honored and happy to, to moderate this. And I will start um, by saying that we people, we, uh, mankind is going through really a, um, an unprecedented global crisis. Um, this should make us think critically about the present and the future of education. Future is a word that has been mentioned before. And when it comes to us urban planners, well, we cannot see the future, but we can plan for it. And this also applies to education. Uh, and in a particular case, we should reflect on the present and future traditional and classical uh, architecture and planning education. The concerns and issues, as we know, are multiform, from the environmental to the social, the cultural and the economics. The 21st century education and pedagogy of the world's school of architecture should be tack tackling all those concerns and many others. Um, can I ask the, the, um, the, the presenters to briefly introduce themselves because their biographies are really, really not only outstanding, but <laughs> their short biographies are, are, are really large. Uh, before you, you go ahead, please um, a, attend to the end of session time. We're not going to run over because we have the movie with uh, Mr. Ruggles after. So your session, please uh, make sure that it ends it on time. Thank you. Yes. Um, can I kindly ask um, the, the presenters to briefly introduce themselves, please? Alessandro, would you please... Be so okay. kind as to, as here, to start. Uh, here I go. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, okay, that's good. You managed to enter in the Zoom meeting. I, I think I answered your email with that. So I graduated in architecture at Sapienza City University of Rome a lot of time ago uh, and, and uh, attended PhD studies therein with a thesis on history of medieval town planning in Ravenna in 2014. Then I, I attended three postdoc grants, Assigno di Ricerca, as it is called there in uh, architectural composition in Rome Sapienza. In 2014, I moved to Cyprus where I uh, taught at the uh, Faculty Ar of Architecture, um, Fine Arts and Design of Gidna American University, directing the uh, Department of Interior Architecture and the International Center for Heritage Studies. In 2018, I moved to Istanbul where I am now, currently at Ozegin University. I am a social professor um, and I direct the <clears throat> DROOM, Dynamic Research on Urban Morphology Laboratory. Our research interest is in the transformation of the built environment, the urban form, 
which means history, what happened in the past, but also means future design, what's going to happen in the future. So I hope I did uh, explain briefly who I am. Thank you very much. Richard, can you follow, please? Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Right. Uh, well, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, uh, JC, and also thank, thank you, uh, Nir. Uh, very nice to be here. It's, I've enjoyed the, the day's sessions very much. Um, uh, very briefly, I don't have the, my biography in front of me, but I should know it. Um, I, I have degrees, uh, both undergraduate and graduate, from Cornell University. I am originally from Athens, Greece. I have worked um, in uh, in the offices in offices in in London, New York, and New Haven. Uh, and about twenty years ago, I joined the University of Notre Dame, where I I have taught, uh, and and um, uh, and run a small practice at the same time. So I've been fortunate enough to be to have participated uh, in. Uh, designs in uh, the new town of Cayala in Guatemala with Leon Creer and my colleagues uh, Pedro Godoy and Maria Sanchez. Um, but um, currently, I am focused on uh, teaching and the uh, and the graduate program in particular. There you have it. Thank you, Samir. Would you please? Yes, uh, my name is Samir Younes. I am. Um, Professor of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame, where I've been teaching for almost 30 years. Um, I've taught other places as well. Um, I was uh, Director of Graduate Studies, uh, as well as Director of Rome Studies uh, at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, I've taught undergraduate and graduate uh, 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 studios, as well as uh, theory classes. I am also a writer. Um, some of my recent uh, books are The Imperfect City, that came out from Rutledge and, um, and the intellectual life of the architects. These are some of my, of my writings. Thanks to Nir and uh, Julio Cesar for, uh, for organizing this, uh, this uh, important conference. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to um, really um, briefly address the some four discussion points that I would like to, uh, that, that we talked about. Um, um, they are very much reflecting our concerns about the current state of architectural education all over the world and what is the possible uh, future for that. So for that, we would like to have a critical analysis of the present and uh, of classical and traditional architecture and planning education. Um, is also, if, if is it necessary and possible to reshape um, the current education and pedagogy landscape and what can we, what can our contribution be in that regard to create an ideal curriculum for the School of Architecture of the 21st century? Without further ado, um, I give the floor up to our presenters. Well, I wonder, uh, JC, I wonder if one good way to start um, uh, I had um, I was under the impression that we might uh, be able to present uh, uh, some thoughts. Um, yes, uh, ahead, but I Richard. don't want I, I don't want to hog the mic, so to speak. So if I may have a few minutes to perhaps talk about the way things are more or less structured at Notre Dame, that might become a bit of a platform from which to to take the conversation further. It would also be an opportunity for Mr. Camis to to also see where we're coming from and the kinds of things we do. So I might, if, if that's okay, if it, uh, I might share this my screen and uh, very, very briefly walk through a few uh, discussion points. Um, I will just very quickly, uh, just bear with me. There we go. Okay, you should have in front of you a slide is that correct, a, a slide of the University of Notre Dame uh, in better weather than we have it currently. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what I just wanted to, just a few, a few talking points really, and I'll, and I'll be as brief as I can and do sound a warning if I go over, uh, please. Uh, and I'll just quickly shut my meeting controls so I can see what I'm looking at. Uh, basically, if, for those of you who uh, don't know our program, um, 
uh, very well. We, uh, our main curriculum is the five-year undergraduate program. Uh, we also have a graduate program that's geared to both uh, professional, uh, to, to, uh, to, to our students uh, who have a, a professional degree and for those who don't. Um, so those are our two principal programs. And the objectives of our program are of course to prepare students for entering the profession, but most importantly, to contribute to the making of a humane, a meaningful, a sustainable, and an enabling built environment. And that is essentially the flag, the banner that we wave above our heads uh, uh, over the towers of Notre Dame. Um, other uh, important uh, objectives for us are, because it's surprising how, how uh, unfamiliar students might be with some of the big issues of the day, but to alert them to the rapidly deteriorating quality of the environment, to instill in them a sense of urgency to restore a healthy, humane, beautiful, and commonsensical environment, to cultivate intellectual curiosity, but also a critical outlook toward uh, today's attitudes in architecture, and finally, to instill a sense of personal responsibility uh, to work toward positive change. Our curriculum, um, we, what we seek to do is to, to balance it by providing a complement of design, which uh, includes architectural and urban design, theory, history, uh, a focus on the environment, and a focus on social justice. We teach students traditional drawing and rendering, uh, not because we're old fogies, but because uh, it, it helps them to develop eye-to-hand coordination. It instills a sense of uh, discipline and also attention to detail. We also teach digital techniques, of course. Uh, and, and we emphasize analytical drawing. As you know, analysis is an essential tool in the design process. Uh, we talk about the built and natural environments as complementary. They're part and parcel of our worlds. They're both, they both are, are the two sides of the same coin. So students must always, regardless of their project, of the nature and scope of their project, they must always consider two scales the architectural scale and the urban scale with every project they do. And we encourage a topological understanding. Uh, we, we tend to speak of three typologies, the urban types, building types, and architectural types um, as part of, of projects. Very briefly, urban types um, are uh, basically, uh, we begin with an understanding that the city is the natural home of humanity. Uh, and of course, the city is, uh, it, it comprises two realms, as Leon Creer has so, so nicely uh, articulated, the, the res publica, the public realm, with its public buildings and spaces, the res privata, or private realm, private buildings. And these two realms combine, they make neighborhoods, or urban quarters. A neighborhood is, is uh, if it sits alone in a landscape, is a village. Two or three make a borough. Three or, or four make a town. Uh, more than four make a city. These are all very familiar concepts to you. Um, neighborhoods are structured around well-defined streets, squares, and blocks. They comprise a mix of residential, commercial, and public functions. They have clear centers and edges. Uh, and they're separated from each other. Um, by corridors uh, where the heavier traffic tends to be channeled. When we talk about building types, building typology, it's the study really of civic types. And these have been neglected since the early 19th century until Bill Westfall brought them back to uh, uh, in front of us with his uh, uh, very helpful essay on building typologies. Um, most schools of architecture talk about types as being formal, and they point to Durand's approach, or functional, uh, looking to Pevsner. But these classifications really are secondary, and they're really just, I mean, they could be useful taxonomies, but they, uh, they are not really building types 
when one thinks about the city and, and what goes into the making of a proper civic environment. Uh, the study of architectural typology, architectural types, which is the last of the three types that I mentioned, uh, begins with a, a close look at the Vitruvian triad, uh, firmness, commodity, and delight. Firmness and commodity, firmitas, utilitas, represent, or they're represented in the technical courses that we teach. And of course, venusitas uh, is, is, is the focus of the design courses. One thing we like to remind students is that this tripodic construct, all the legs, these three legs of this tripod that make architecture are essential. You kick one out, the edifice collapses. But we also note that venusitas, the, the, the study of delight of what makes the poetry in architecture is what distinguishes us from the engineer. There is no other distinction. I think this is an important point we make with our students. Architectural typology, um, we, we talk about vernacular forms as being as representative of craft traditions. They're the product of necessity uh, and they, they are represented in the simpler structures that tend to be uh, belong to the private realm. Uh, whereas classical forms elevate these simple vernacular expressions into poetical ones and they form sophisticated compositional languages which are tectonic in nature. Uh, they represent an intellectual tradition. Uh, and of course, uh, we, in, as part of, of, of the study of architectural types, we, we include such things as the elements of composition, tectonics, language, proportion, etc., and composition itself, which is formal or informal. That, uh, ha having said that much about design, uh, another important component of our teaching is theory. Our foundational theory courses tend to be presented as a history of ideas in architecture. Um, and we uh, expose our students to uh, the, uh, the great architectural treatises from Vitruvius to Alberti to the later Renaissance authors. But we also like to dwell on <laughs> the later chapters of our, our architectural history in which uh, the unity of the arts gradually dissolved beginning in the 18th century. And we look closely at the rise of modernism, what led to it. And uh, we talk about this, uh, we talk about modernism as representing a shift in paradigm uh, in which uh, what, what used to be an understanding of architecture as representing the natural laws of stability is now, it now turns to the geometric inert forms of the machine, uh, more specifically the combustion engine. That's, that's where modernism is coming from. So we ask students to consider these two paradigms and, and, and ponder which of these two paradigms is the most appropriate one for the making of shelter. Also, as part of our theory uh, sequences, uh, we talk about the effects of modernist zoning strategies on the city, uh, the validity of modernist uh, precepts like the zeitgeist or spirit of the age. Uh, and also we, we, we look closely at the postmodern critique and the rise of new traditional architecture, uh, which is what it, it's all about today. We try to teach history not as a deterministic march of progress, but as a series of applications of common sense in various cultures and periods, uh, or even the failure to do so as, as has happened in, in our present day. Uh, and of course, the study of history includes all human cultures and traditions, not just Western, uh, and it, uh, it, it concludes with the discussion, the, the study of the rise of new traditional architecture and urbanism. Study of the environment stresses the impact of the modern building industry and attitudes toward the city and remedial measures uh, that, that alleviate the, 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 the negative effects. And finally, social justice, we talk about 
as much as we can, we incorporate a focus on affordable housing, emergency housing. We've had a number of studios where we've looked at the creation of refugee settlements and such uh, urban task forces to provide alternative visions for disadvantaged communities um, that are and, 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 and areas that are blighted by um, urban renewal uh, policies. Uh, that's where I will leave it. I will now uh, stop the share and I'm happy to, uh, to hand the mic over. So Julio Cesar, should I begin? Uh, yes, please, Samir, go ahead. Okay, I'm, go you. I'm going to also share my screen. Please let me know if you can see it. I hope you can. Julio Cesar, does it? Yes, is it it's, 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 it's very well seen, Samir. Okay, good, I'm not always sure. Thank about you, it's, it's wonderful, wonderful images. Okay, good. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to briefly um, uh, speak about certain uh, of the foundational concepts uh, uh, of our education at Notre Dame. I say foundational, not necessarily beginning uh, 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 concepts. And I will show you just a few examples from one studio of mine from a few years ago uh, as, as a backdrop to some of uh, the explanations that I'll be uh, uh, going through. Um, all of the world's architectural traditions in their successes and their failures are now available for our use. And this is one of the most significant cultural conditions since the late 18th century. To judiciously blend the right lessons from this ever accumulating knowledge with intelligence, with the intelligence of our, of our own experience, uh, this requires working toward a far reaching goal, which is the durable co-evolution between nature and the city. Now, how we, pass, how we pass on this wisdom to future generations depends on certain foundational concepts, which are indispensable to this vital form of making, of shaping, that we call architecture. And architecture at its best uh, enables us to wisely dwell within nature and to wisely build the city within nature. Such foundational concepts frame the very existence of architecture, indeed, of any art. And I'm going to mention a few of them. So they include the entwined, the interlaced relationships between conventions and traditions, imitation and invention, the vernacular and the classical, or the civic, if you will. All of these amount to a wide, all of this amounts to a wide ranging architectural knowledge. Now, how are these concepts entwined? How do they cohere? How do they form a coherent whole, really? This forms, this is actually one of the highest goals and essential test of the teaching at the University of Notre Dame. Conventions, how, how we agree upon things. Conventions imply an alliance of thought that is collectively elaborated and transformed. More than simply inherited common sense, architectural conventions at their best exemplify a sense in common, which is a purposeful agreement or consensus building efforts between many minds to elaborate a shared artistic practice. To put it differently, conventions embody collective rationality. Conventions are at once poetic and I'm using the term in the ancient sense, the ancient Greek sense of uh, poin, the verb to make, to shape. So conventions are at once poetic and practical. And as such, they are the means of imitation and invention in architecture. They are poetic in the sense of the underlying reasons for architectural form, for example, composition, tectonics, they are practical as a means to apply and modify the lessons of the building experience to suit the demands of present construction with a special attention to execution, to realization. Practical conventions also concern the crafts used to embody, to embody architectural knowledge. Conventions and their larger regional assemblies are known as traditions. They converge a broad range of architectural experience 
especially the kind of experience that intelligently challenges and improves accepted wisdom. Conventions and larger traditions are teachable because they embody the rationality of successful building experiences. But, but with an important caveat, too rigid an application of conventions places constrictions on invent inventiveness. Too lax an application of conventions leads from license to caprice, from caprice to the corruptly uncanny. We see this when individual taste and expression are considered as the only determining guide and thus come to be understood as the logical opposites of conventions. And yet, contrary to some beliefs, conventions sometimes benefit from license because while licenses are exceptions to agreements on the rules of practice, they do not necessarily imply the rejection of such rules of practice. Indeed, as individual interpretations, some licenses reinforce accepted rules or conventions by accepting them as larger collective experiences. Tempered by reason and by propriety, license can be useful for invention. Now, imitation and invention. Imitation and architecture provides the intellectual discipline that enables the architect to judiciously select and unify relevant aspects of the building experience. In larger terms, this is the truly instrumental value of historical knowledge. But mere antecedents, mere age, is insufficient for a building to become exemplary for one's use in the present. Age value alone is insufficient for a building or a convention to become truly operative precedents. Therefore, reason, reason is vital in selecting what is properly and directly useful for the daily intellectual life of the architect in the service of present needs and the greater service of nature and the city. Imitation is categorically distinguished from the copy. The copy implies identical repetition, while imitation implies the production of dissimilar buildings based on a common set of principles. Such a common set of principles, for example, is the notion of architectural types or architectural characters. Far from making objects out of nothing, invention as a combinatory art seeks to improve the rational choice made from preceding experiences based on a justified need. Therefore, imitation and invention are an inseparable couple. This is one of the most major distinctions between modernism and modern traditional architecture. For modernism, invention is an end in itself. It is opposed to imitation and it conflates the imitation with the copy. For modern traditional architecture, imitation and inventions, invention are two facets of the same coin. Classical. The term classical has had many meanings throughout history and it is given several meanings also amongst many modern traditional architects. Ever a synonym to excellence in the visual and literary arts, the, co the concept of the classical in architecture has been used to designate either historical or qualitative categories. In certain historical contexts, it designated the Periclean, the Augustan, the Carolingian Renaissance, uh, the Mauryan dynasty in India, the Tang dynasty in China, the Renaissance in many countries since the 15th century, the so-called neoclassical the neoclassical period and many, many of these traditions operating well into the 20th century and beyond. More importantly, it's also the re-elaboration of traditional architecture by modern traditional architects since the middle 1970s. As a qualitative category now, the classical has been frequently used as a value judgment, a good value judgment, associated with maintaining desirable principles such as rationality, harmony, symmetries, always in the plural, propriety, noble simplicity, solidity, durability, and so forth. More, most importantly, the term classical and traditional are entwined with the idea of received knowledge 
and the authority of reason. But, but, if tradition has an authority, it is the authority of reason. Currently, currently the, word, the, the, the term classical is applied in three general ways. One is a historical application. For example, that which is termed classical designates only the architectures of ancient Greece and Rome as the foundations of the architectures of Western countries. This is one definition, which I find to be the narrowest. A second application is slightly broader. That which is termed classical includes the derivatives of Greek and Roman architectures in their disseminated movement throughout Europe, North and South America, as well as former colonies around the world. A third application is actually much more inclusive and much more cross-cultural in its scope. Indeed, it includes and transcends the other two. It considers the classical as part of a broad range of architectural expression that spans from the private realm to the public realm, respectively designated as the vernacular and the classical or the civic. Reason comparison between multiple architectural traditions throughout the world reveals that they contain a range of architectural expressions that answer the need of the most humble private house in the countryside to the most elaborate com commemorative public edifice. The composition of architectural elements in modest and private constructions, in those compositions, sills, lintels, rafters, openings, and so forth, find themselves transformed, refined, ennobled in the composition of buildings that serve the public realm, be it a village or a city. Simple lintels become architraves, ordinary rafters become modillions, windows become edicules, and a modest porch becomes an impressive arcade. If the constructions of the private realm are termed the vernacular, and the constructions of the public realm are termed the civic or the classical, then both the vernacular and the classical grow from one another and mutually partake in conforming one another with propriety. To put it differently, the range between the vernacular and the classical corresponds to the range between construction and architecture. This distinction was already present in the Vitruvian text. The two general categories of traditional architectural expression then are the vernacular and the classical or civic. They are inseparable. Both partake in forming what we call the sense of place. No city is made of private buildings exclusively, nor public edifices exclusive. It is in comparison with private buildings that the civic, the civic edifice gains its hierarchical value, its figurative distinction, its proper, proper sovereign mon monumentality. The city finds its completion in a judicious combination of the private and the public realms, even if, even if present conditions in many cities betray a divorce between architectural character and propriety. The architecture of the public realm, for example, the library, the municipality, the architecture of the public realm is presently in retreat in comparison to the architecture of the private realm, for example, the office. Powerful private interests use the most ostentatious architectural extravaganzas, served by architects who place their own personal expression over and above the public realm. That is why, that is why many architects build in the city, but fewer architects build the city. Building the city for the foreseeable future will likely include at best, at best fragments of an urban order. By definition, traditional knowledge is rooted in reason and what is deservedly enduring in tradition. Traditional knowledge can ever be renewed, revised, adapted to best suit, uh, to best suit present demands in view of dwelling enduringly within nature and within the city. Blindly repeating a tradition is an affront to reason. Blindly rejecting a tradition is also an affront to reason. The soundness of reason, the soundness of tradition, 
derives from the soundness of reason. In other words, from the continual reflection, agreement, and disagreement between many minds, contemplating similar concerns and enriched by the wisdom of experience. Such is the rationality of traditional architecture as a modern practice. Following the hard-earned lessons since the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the practice of tradition stands to benefit from avoiding the belief, avoiding the belief in an unsurpassable and idealized past, and avoiding the belief in an unknown, idealized future that will somehow emerge from a technologically determined reality. The use of collective reason, however, is not a safeguard against error. Look at the catastrophes that deeply wounded the city and deeply wounded nature. Catastrophes that resulted from the rationality of modernism. So reason can err. It cannot always be vigilant, but it can always be reformed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samir. May I encourage people in the audience to ask questions? To our, our panelists. So to what extent do the panelists feel that over-intellectualism exists within a traditional architectural uh, forum versus uh, a, a less nuanced, more uh, not standard, but perhaps uh, invent individual individual oriented understanding of things. In other words, in other words, uh, to a person who can't read, which could be the case for persons who exist within, you know, early Renaissance or medieval times. Uh, what what does their understanding have to contribute to uh, traditional uh, understanding of the built environment? Richard, Samir, would you like to answer to that question? I think uh, think there were several questions there, um, right? I think I yes, I, there were. I retained one of one thing over intellectualization among traditional architects. Was that one of the questions? Yes, correct. Yes, yes. I uh, I don't know what that means. Honestly, I I I. Um, I think uh, I think all of us would need uh, let's 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 avoid using the word linked intellectualization, and simply replace it by delving deeply into the uh, the very making of any particular art of any particular practice, and that requires a deep reflection that is uh, essentially um, that, that lasts for decades, and certain things need to be uh, need to be approached um, um, with a sufficient depth. Uh, with respect to uh, the individualized uh, question that you asked, well, of course, anyone, anyone apprehending, um, anyone apprehending uh, um, any phenomenon, will appre app apprehend it with his or her own background, whatever that 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 thing is. It is inevitable for one to have individualized uh, um, um, uh, expressions, individualized individualized uh, 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 reactions to things. However, however. Uh, it, the, uh, our work, uh, practical, academic, all of it, is uh, rarely an individual work. It is always in engagement with other minds. And that's how traditions evolve. That's how they pass on their knowledge to further traditions and so forth. Uh, so in other words, the individual uh, um, thought, individual reactions, individual formulations of any positions are Formulate, are worked out in engagement. And that's how we essentially were able to learn from each other. And I'll stop for in a second. I'll just say that the following thing, traditional knowledge means that we have to understand failures as well as successes of traditional traditions altogether. All, all Avoiding failures if we can, 
and uh, improving, maintaining successes if we can. Richard, would you like to add something? Well, I, I, I guess I um, read the question uh, slightly differently. What I, what I sensed in the, in the way it was asked was, um, it was really a question about to what degree uh, should uh, an architectural education uh, focus on, on craft and um, uh, building uh, knowledge as opposed to theory. Uh, that's how I read it. I mean, I think uh, I entirely agree with, with my colleague Samir um, that an architectural education is 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 a broad thing, and and uh, one has to uh, to include not just uh, in all the things that I, I mentioned, including theory uh, and craft. It all has to come together, um, and and so I think to some degree, if I interpreted the question correctly, I think it, it, it's. Um, it's important that we include craft traditions in architectural education as well, I would say. And that's, that's something that I, I think that, you know, we can always continue to, uh, to reinforce. Um, so um, anyway, that, that, that's, my, that's my response to that. Yes, may I add that? Um, uh, it is sorry, clear. what about the timing? I'm afraid we're going out with the timing. Okay, it's, uh, I have uh, 3.41, so we, we still have four more minutes, right? Am I right or am I close? Yes, what? yes, yes. Is it okay? Yes. Uh, I think that the, that the discussion here um, embraces um, multiple things. Um, basically, if I want to summarize it, I would put it this way. One thing is what you teach, and the other is how you teach it. And the classical and the tradition um, shows that they provide a system that can be linked to the theoretical framework in such a way that the training of the students is a comprehensive one uh, that is suitable for not only understanding the past, but providing the, the right answers to the, to the future. But who judges that? Well, um, the ultimate goal of the, of the training of an architect in any school is to, to practice uh, in an office, either uh, privately or, or in a big office. Uh, what, what the student, uh, what the graduate bring to that realm is informed by his training or her training. So the, the theoretical background, the, the knowledge that the person brings to the practice is to be uh, on the one hand tested uh, with real projects and on the other hand with, uh, with uh, absorbing new knowledge by the exchange with, uh, with the real world, either from colleagues or from, from other practitioners, meaning craftsmen. I, I've always been interested on, on the, on the, on the, the causes how Notre Dame uh, came to be, you know, the School of Architecture of Notre Dame came to be so uh, centered in this uh, traditional architecture and classical architecture teaching, uh, how it developed uh, the group of teachers, what happened, what was the historical uh, uh, line of events that made it be, because it's, it's very interesting how, how it is an institution that has a, a very particular Focus. The, the the biggest major event is that Tom that well one person as far as I understand it, which is Thomas Borden Smith, was unashamed to say that traditional classical architecture is a thing which has its own level and it has its own uh, level of superiority and and um, cognitive quality which we should not be ashamed of and which he was not ashamed of and which a lot of the rest of us are not ashamed of and we shouldn't be and that's it uh, uh, he was not ashamed of those things and he said 
uh, I'm, we should have a program which, which is based upon these things. And it does, and it is uh, very well uh, adhered to a classical uh, Catholic university, which has as its logical basis tradition, which traditional and classical architecture has as its basis a tradition uh, in 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 former logical concepts, which we can continue to discuss and, and we can continue to debate certainly the things which were at that time, at those previous times discussed and accepted are not now dis uh, accepted in the same way or, or form. But it is certainly the case that at Notre Dame as a Catholic university, it is the prime, it is one of the prime locations and and constructs in which one would form such a an or an intellectual basis so it, you know even even modernists like stanley tigerman who did in fact make this exact same argument before certainly i ever had the idea to make it uh said the, the, the world has a place for a classical architecture school and probably it really should be a classical school. And he made that not quite 10 years ago, maybe eight or maybe eight or so. So, uh, you know, Notre Dame exists not only in, in, in and of itself because it makes sense, but also because it makes sense in context of a classic of a excuse me a classical school or a, a, a Catholic school, but also in context of of its own self in that it makes sense that it, that that at least one school exists in this sense. I'm sorry, Greg, but uh, now you. we're running out of time. Thank you. That was lovely. Address. All right, that was long-winded. Sorry. We can address those and, and any other question directly by email.